At this time now, though, Jeff and I both have the pleasure of introducing our featured poet, Bobby Bird. Bobby Bird is a lesbian poet who lives in Osseo, Michigan. Bobby has been very active in the Lansing area, having been a member of the Lansing Poetry Club, along with the Poetry Society of Michigan, and has performed at several Lansing area venues. She self-published her first collection, Poetry, the Music of a Woman's Words, in 1981, and released her most recent book, Seasons of the Soul, in 2003. Honor of meeting Bobby at a Her Stories Project program last February called Embodying Our Words. And I found her poetry both gentle and powerful. And I haven't been able to connect with her in person to get through more of it. So it's partly for me, I'm happy Bobby here tonight be in our feature. But her work is powerful and gentle and is going to enrich us tonight. I am 100% positive. So. Let's welcome Bobby Bird. Thank you both. I also want to thank the Peace Education Center for helping with my transportation costs so I could be here tonight. Um, the first poem is written about a friend of mine, Carolyn. It's called Keeping a Straight Face. In a ritual of many years, she'd stand before the morning glass, inspecting curl and painted lips, straightening her seams. To her students and her family, I'm sorry, to her students and her colleagues, but most of all to family, she tried to be the epitome of what they all expected. As people file into the funeral home, what must they be thinking? Do they wonder why she killed herself? Can they look beneath the paint to see the woman that pain erased, who couldn't deliver herself straight-faced? Would they have hired her if she had told them? Would they have loved her if she had told them? Would she have killed herself if only she could have told them? The next one is written about a girl who grew up in the 50s, who was a classmate a couple of years ahead of my mother. And it's a true story. It's called Twyla's Truth. Of all the girls in Twyla's class, no parents were more proud. A bright future seemed assured as she stood to give her speech. A gifted musician, she played piano, could really make it sing. In the 50s, a few girls went to college, but she was valedictorian. Popular with lots of friends, everybody loved her, until one day she came back from school with the news she'd found a girlfriend. Her fearful Christian parents thought their daughter must be ill and took her to a doctor who pronounced Twyla insane. How can love be called crazy? I'll never understand. The Jesus I know taught inclusive love and that we're family. Her life became a living hell. They institutionalized and fried her brain with shock treatments, sterilized her, and pulled her teeth. This young woman's life of promise was shattered beyond repair. She'd walk the roads and turn away and the cars would pass, ashamed. She never played piano again, nor lit the faces of those she loved. She spent her days in foster care until she fell downstairs one day. This tale is true and told to me by someone I knew well, who stayed long in her closet after watching Twilight's fate. Illusions of difference. How hard it must be to be different from the day that one arrives. So obvious it's impossible to fit in and see with scorn. 
I can't imagine the confusion of looking in a mirror and seeing someone reflected that doesn't match who you are. What of those with minds and bodies that do not coincide? How difficult to challenge the transgender face each day. Society has trouble with ambiguity. We tend to like things tidy, with boundaries neat and clear. Male or female, black or white, each is either this or that. We need to let go of our fears. We're all one in truth. Like you, I have a love poem. Heterosexuals have a, a difficult time with our displays of affection, whether they're in public displays or whether they're in writing. So, too bad. This <laughs> <laughs> one's called All Moon Moth. In the velvet black cosmos of summer's night's office, I looked at the luminous opal of the moon. I search for the glimmer of white glowing ember. I'm drawn like a moth to the lantern and moon. Careening through darkness and rapture of kisses, I dance in your pale shining light, tender moon. Three years ago, my mother died. She had a brain tumor. We were together 30 years. It took me about 10 months before I was able to write anything. One of the other ways that we experience violence from society is that our grief is disenfranchised. We're not allowed to grieve for someone who doesn't fit their idea of partner. My lover went through a lot of things in her life. And so my first poem was one of trying to make sense of it and why she had to go through so much. So it's called Making Sense of It. Your heart was broken even before your birth. It was stained by a mother's tears. She didn't want another child born to poverty. Your disappointed father wanted a boy instead of you. Innocence stolen by abuse. Your first memory was a beating in a hunt chair, and it happened daily until you were 15 and you fought back. How could a father force his child to kill? By five, you snuffed out lives along a trap line with a club. Later, he made you wring the necks of hapless sparrows. The rape at nine and sexual betrayal by three beloved uncles left you bruised. But your resilient heart survived and blossomed still, despite the hidden wounds that lay unhealed. I thought, if I could just love you enough, that maybe I could soothe your bad past. After 20 years, you still waited for me to leave. You felt yourself unlovable. Even after 30, surely I must be the only one. Finally, on your deathbed, the grateful gestures of so many your love had touched was the proof, the evidence so overwhelming. You looked up at me in surprise and said, they're doing this for me. I replied, they love you, dear. And at last she understood. Even though I facilitate Grief recovery groups for hospice and have for many years. We still have to do our own process and in our own time. Spring flood. Rains soften the frozen ground of my heart. Heaven shed the tears that I could not. Tied in knots, I steeled myself to stave off pain. But one cannot tiptoe through grief. At last, floodgates no longer held the sadness I tried so hard to keep at bay. A rising tide swept me off my feet, but somehow I knew I didn't swim alone. 
God's love, a life raft, came to rescue me. The arms of friends harbored my battered soul through months of desperate desolation becalmed, and later secured me through the fiercest gales. In my darkest days, an angel dog named Buddy, who loved you nearly as much as I myself, kissed my tears away and never left me, just as he did for you before we passed. Now, from the deepest recess of my being, and heaven's urban season ever new, you witness as the drops nourish new blossoms, and the rains begin the greeting. Good news. Lunch in a movie with best friends. Our best friends. We all miss you, but we've begun to find our way back to the living, back to your death. Today we share good news together like we always did. Be announced certifiably crazy. With Social Security granted, in two years, Medicare should pay for knee replacements. There is hope for a future with less pain after rehab. On the way to eat, I looked up and cried for joy. There, painted across the sky, was another reminder that you still celebrate with us. How like you was that perfect rainbow, an always spontaneous, never subtle reflection of your smile. We always wanted to have a skylight, but never could afford one. So this was what we did instead. <laughs> it's called skylight. Beneath the pasted skylight of planets and stars that still glow nightly above our bed, I remember how you thrilled to watch the lightning and once built a wooden porch swing to savor bullfrog songs. I recall your hair tussled by Pacific winds that wild El Nino winter we spent on the coast, and the delight in your eyes with every adventure and misadventure, and your hearty laughter after each. It is these distant memory stars for which I yearn, yet they leave me desolate and unfulfilled. Never again can I surprise you with shop for treats, nor can you take my part, as you always do. It was your love which always warmed me to the core, and in your arms that I found my home. I pen these words beneath our private sky while my whole world aches without you here. At first the difference in our ages had worried you, but I had said however long we had would be enough. Though 30 years, half my life, I spent with you, from heaven you hear me admit that I was wrong. It's never long enough. Monaco Lake. Um, it's a lake up near Lake Superior. And I was halfway up a hill. And I got a phone call from Alex. <laughs> Way up in the Yuki. Monaco Lake. Today, as you'd asked, I sifted your ashes into Lake Superior at Whitefish Point. The white powder clouds the sparkling waves and joins the inland sea. The last time I was here, you were with me in the flesh. It was to be our last trip together, though I didn't know it at the time. We watched the waves polish stones on the beach. As always, I collected some in a sack to carry home. You rested on a large driftwood stump. Later, I coaxed you to the souvenir shop. There you told the staff how still the water had been the night before the Edmund Fitzgerald went down. Like pilgrims, we traveled to some of nature's shrines. We lunched on rutabaga soup and buffalo burgers. These were exotic fare for trolls, as the locals <laughs> called those who lived below the bridge. <laughs> Monaco Lake was not in our plans again that trip. It had not been for many years, though its precious memories lingered for us both. Now, though, I am determined to reach the summit of the trail one last time. There is something there that I must see. 
I dig my cane out of the car, put my raincoat on against the chill, and head out. One picture of a mossy stump is all I take before the path begins to rise up the steep slope. Then, resolute, I focus on the way ahead and climb. My hair is red now, but you can see the gray infiltrate year by year. Going like 60 doesn't seem so fast anymore. 45 minutes of no breaks or turns I ascend. I could not make it this time without the cane. But drenched in sweat, I do make it at last. I'd been afraid that I would have to search and maybe not find it after all these years. Yet, here it stands at the very end of the trail. It looms ahead clearer with every stride. The tree still prominently bears our names with the heart we'd carved into bark so long ago. We had climbed the steep grade together that day. It had been an accomplishment even then. We had savored towering trees, wildflowers on the path, the sweet smell of woods and the clean air. Now, lips to tree, I sin to kiss to you, my darling. Our spirits stand here together, touching heaven, where your name is forever etched upon my heart. Till death did us part. We married on the Capitol steps many years ago. With other lesbians and gays, we stood up for our rights and declared our love's commitment for all the world to see. Privately, we'd done so many years before. We marched in Lansing, then Detroit, and Washington, D.C. CNN halved our numbers, but we were there and watched as rainbow crowds overflowed the streets as far as our eyes could see. On our 20th anniversary, we were married in our church. With a pastor signed certificate, we ceremoniously cut the cake and celebrated with family and friends and honeymoon in Sagata. We shared our lives for 30 years. It makes me really sad that you died before we had a chance to marry legally. Maybe some of you have been watching the, the news about a bill that the Senate, the Michigan Senate, passed recently and has gone to the House. And this is about that. It's called New Law. Apparently in Michigan, the Senate's passed a bill. Majority Republicans say hate's okay sometimes. And harassment can be justified if bullies claim outrage based upon morality. Victims, to the victims deserve their fate. Fundamentalists judge some children less worthy to protect if gay, lesbian, or transgender, their judgments fuel the flames. So what if kids get knocked around or tormented online, even until they kill themselves? Religions call it right to punish those who don't fit in. Heterosexual is the only option which is blessed by the powers that be. But there's a greater truth that self-righteousness forgets. Religions share a common flaw. They preach love yet foster hate. Most religions have been twisted by those with narrow minds, even to justify slavery shame and make chattel of men's wives. Our, as our society matures and the day can't come too soon, the world will come to realize what the real sin has been. People tend to persecute and even demonize those they think are not like them, little do they know that it could have easily been them who was born in the other's skin. Who would choose to be oppressed? Identity's not a choice. My God doesn't make mistakes, and in those eyes, we're fine. Theologians make pronouncements from their sacred texts and decide which rules apply that ignore their full intent. Jesus never made exclusions. He preached love all the same, that everyone's our neighbor, various traits not specified. Fundamentalists come in many stripes, Christians, Muslims, Jews. Like Pharisees, rigidity has blinded them to love. So we'll have to be the light until compassion dawns, when they awaken in a later life, in the other's place. I would recommend that you call your state resident representatives or write them and ask them to remove Section 8 from Senate Bill 137. If you need that information afterwards, see me. The last one that I'd like to share 
um, since we're talking about wars and violence and militarism and that sort of thing, is the fact that more wars have been fought in the name of religion than any other reason. And this was written shortly before September 11th. It's called Fragments. No structure of brick and mortar or institution can lay claim to the entirety of your plan. You speak truth to all denominations, whispering in the heart of each soul. We have torn up the map of heaven, and each holds but a fragment of the whole. Like squabbling children, we cling to tiny pieces, believing that we alone hold the key. In light of spirit, let us remember our way home to one another, and so to you. Thank you. Thank you.